So now let's turn to the Quran, inshallah, and specifically one of those areas, sadness. One of those emotions that obviously troubles every one of us, and it's a part of our life. How does the Quran deal with it? First and foremost, and this is again for those of you aspiring to contribute, and this is what all of you should be thinking, especially those that are going into the psychology field. The, I'll, I'll try, try to divide my talk here. This introduction was the rant part, so it doesn't count. So now the talk begins, and I'll try to divide it into three parts. My talk into three parts. The first part of it is actually just some areas that are worth exploring, especially for students of psychology, counseling, people that are going to be in the work of maybe helping others, imams in training, imams that have a lot of people with emotional issues coming to them. Or, you know, if you're going, inshallah, eventually into the work of youth counseling, or you're in the position where you're offering people advice, things like that, then there, here are some things from the Quran that you might want to pay attention to, especially dealing with the subject of sadness and depression. The first word used in the Quran for sadness is al-gham. There are several words used, and the first in the Quran we find is al-gham. Ghayn, mim, mim are the root origins. The same word is used, a variation of that word is ghamam, which actually means clouds in the sky. And if clouds remain and no sunlight is able to break through, that kind of a cloud is called a rama. Sometimes you have clouds that light comes, comes through. Sometimes you have cloud, clouds that light is completely blocked, right? And if that remains for a long time, it can get pretty depress depressing, right? If the weather remains cloudy for an extensively long amount of time and you don't see sunlight, then it gets pretty depressing, which explains the psychological state of most of the people in the United Kingdom because it's cloudy most of the time, right? But, you know, so, and it's weird, like, you know, like Seattle has a really, like, weirdly high suicide rate. I'm not saying there's a correlation, but it's always cloudy, <laughs> you know? It's one of the highest suicide rates in America, and even though it's a beautiful state, nature, the, you know, the environment, the architecture, it's a clean city, you know? And it's, but, but regardless, it's got some major, major issues, it's weird. But there is a connection, and it's found in virtually every society. Happiness is associated with a shiny, bright day, and sadness is associated with what? Dark clouds. And even it makes its way even into literature. So people say things like, you know, there's like a dark cloud overhead. You know? You know, there's like, you know, when my, when my, when my husband comes home, it's like a dark cloud over the house, <laughs> or something like that, right? So. This is not just limited to ancient Arab discourse, but they were very human, and there are some things we share with them. Right? The idea of brightness and light being associated with happiness. Even nowadays, they have these like multi-million dollar like, uh, pharmaceutical companies that sell antidepressant pills, and they spend millions of dollars in their advertising industry, and they're showing a lady walking in the sun. And when she's depressed, there's a cloud over the sun, and she's just sitting there. Do you have bad thoughts? <laughs> Take this pill. And then the quickly inside, in the, in the quick credits at the end, or the disclaimers at the end, uh, might make you suicidal. And then they go, move on. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sad anymore because I'm dead. <laughs> but anyway, so Ramam is actually a state of unrest. Ramam is a state of unrest. And let's, going back to the analogy of the clouds, what that's the, the word Ram describes in the Arabic language a kind of sadness where the bad thing hasn't happened yet, but you're anticipating it to happen. Because if there's a lot of dark clouds forming, what does that mean for the Arab? Well, that means maybe a storm is coming, some tornado is coming, right? People before us were a lot more in touch with nature. We're so into our technology, we don't even look at another person's face. We're just stuck in our phone. But people before looked at the sky all the time, and when they saw a lot of dark clouds, it was like they were anticipating something bad to happen. Lightning to strike, thunder, rain, something could, could happen. And in some cases good, but in many cases bad, right? Now, this word is used in the Quran in a very particular context. And I'm not here to discuss every context of every word with you, but what I'm here to suggest is that if a study was made of, for instance, a, a kind of sadness where you're anticipating things to get worse, then the word gham is used. How is it used in the Quran? What situations did Allah describe gham with? And the study of that, how will that help me deal with someone who keeps thinking the future is bleak? Who never sees the bright side of things? Who's always looking at the glass as half empty? Someone who's pessimistic all the time, negative all the time. Don't look at the person next to you. But, like, you know, <laughs> but it can have, it can take, you can have people like that, that are always downers. They're never happy. They can't just see something, they can't see the, the, the good side of something. They have to see the bad side of something, right? And that is a particular quality of gham. 
If you have too much gham, that's the kind of person you become. The next term, very popular term in the Quran, commonly used is al-huzn. Al-huzn, and the root letters for that are ha, za, and nun. And this is for one to remain uh, unhappy or uneasy about something. You're not settled about something. It's keeping you from going to sleep. You keep worrying about something. It's actually the opposite of farah. Farah actually means you can't sleep because you're too happy. That's farah. That's the, it's the exact opposite. Now you can't sleep because you're too sad. You're too depressed. You're too worried. You can't just, you keep thinking about something and it's not letting you go. Maybe you've been looking for a job for a long time. You can't find it. It's all you're thinking about. You're driving, you're thinking about it. Maybe you were, you know, about to get married and two months before the marriage, they, you know, the other family said, no, we don't like you anymore. You know, uh, and you're in depression. Like, I, I had everything set. You printed the cards. You know, it was on my Facebook page. And now we have, you know, what, Ali and Sarah.com. Paid for one year's hosting on the head. Where am I going to find another Sama now? It's crazy. But, <laughs> but the idea is that it's, it's something that is, um, that it, it sets on you. Huzn, the ulama say like, ulama al lugha the linguists and the people of lexicons, they say that Huzn is an onset. Uh, it's, it sets into a person after an incident. Something happens, and as a result, you become depressed. Something, you were hoping something worked out your way, and it didn't work out your way. Like the old examples you find in the ancient books are like the farmer who was looking forward to his crop and you know, a month before he's going to harvest, a storm comes and destroys the entire farm. All his hopes are tor torn down and his entire year's labor is taken away from him, right? So you have high hopes for something and you're looking forward as something is going to bring you joy and it ends up bringing you a great deal of sadness. Hosen is actually one of the most common words used to describe sadness in the Quran. So it requires a study in and of itself. But one ayah at least deserves our attention. Very beautiful. Allah Azza wa Jalla says many, many, many times in the Quran, لا خوف عليهم. You can finish this one for me. لا خوف عليهم. ولا هم يحزنون. Very common in the Quran, right? And the the, the, the language of this ayah is remarkable. Uh, but I'll give you just a little bit of commentary about the commentary about the language of this ayah. ولا هم يحزنون. The word home in the ayah is actually an addition. So you don't, you can linguistically say wala yahzanun. You can just say wala yahzanun, but Allah says wala hum yahzanun. And this is done in the Arabic rhetorical, one of the rhetorical devices, the purpose of which is al ithbat ala ghayr al fa'il, to allude to someone who's not there. In other words, Allah is saying, they will have no grief, they will have no fears on them, judgment day. Believers will have no fears on them, and it won't be they that are in a state of sadness. It's not them that are going to be in a state of sadness. What does that seem to indicate? If it's not them that are in a state of sadness, that means somebody else is going to be. The home there actually indicates somebody else in between parentheses. That's the beauty of the Arabic language. What we're learning from that is you will have states of sadness in life, in this world. Huzn will be there. But a perpetual state of sadness is actually not for you. And whatever Huzn you're going through is nothing compared to the Huzn of that day. Whatever grief you're going through, whatever suffering or emotional trauma you're going through, and I'm, I'm not minimizing it any, in any way, but what Allah is saying is the khuzan of that day is the actual khuzan. It's the actual khuzan. And it's not like if you feel sad, you must not have good iman. That's not true either. We'll talk about that a little. That's, that will be my second part. Is it true that if we really had iman, we would never be sad? No, absolutely not. That's not true at all. Prophets experienced a great deal of sadness. Righteous people experienced a great deal of sadness. The Quran is full of stories in which one of the central themes is sadness itself. Sadness is a part of life, it's a reality of life. The Quran is not there to eliminate sadness, the Quran is there to help us navigate it. Because it is one of the tests of life. Just like happiness is one of the tests of life. Just like anger is one of the tests of life. It's not like you can eliminate, eliminate anger. You can't. These are emotions that were programmed inside of us. It's like saying, like you're eliminating one of the things that is inside you, like a limb. These are, these are the, the unseen limbs of our, of our being, right? These emotions that we have. Quran teaches us to navigate them in a healthy way. We'll talk about that in my second session.